Well, hey, welcome back to, believe it or not, season four of Armchair Architects. You folks said you wanted more, and we're here to deliver. Specifically, you wanted us to talk about AI. Hey, welcome back to Armchair Architects. We're talking about AI this season, and now we're going to talk about vector databases. So let's bring the architects on. Hey, Eric. Hey, Uli. Good to see you again. Um, we're going to talk about vector databases, and I have to admit, I don't quite get what they are. Can one of you, like, uh, you know, read me into this this magic new world? Yeah, sure. Uh, so vector databases are a way in which we store meaningful information about multidimensional aspects of data as what's called vectors, which are numerical, typically numerical integers. And it works very much like a traditional relational database system. But what's really interesting around the vector databases uh, is that they help us solve different types of queries. Uh, one type of query is like a nearest neighbor. So if I'm Spotify and I know that Eric Sharon loves Def Leppard and he loves this one song. What are some of the nearest other songs that are very, very similar based on a number of dimensions that Spotify might have so that I can recommend this other song? And the way that it works is that it's just using numerical distance between the, the vectors to figure that answer to that question out. Yeah, so and, and, I would add to this, David, before you go, um, yeah. that vector databases in the context of AI are effectively using text. And they're converting text into these numerical um, representations that Eric pointed out. And so if you go into the Postgres community, for example, the Postgres teams have already added a plugin into Postgres where you can take any text field, turn it into a vector, and then you effectively take that vector and uh, embed it into the uh, large language model. And we'll talk about what an embedding is later. Yeah, I was hoping we'd get to that, but you just answered my question, Uli, which is like, why, you know, like, when would you use this? Like, why and why, why does it show up in the AI context at all? Because it just sounds like, you know, it could be used for anything. Um, and is it new? I mean, have we been using this forever and we just realized that we, we could start using the same technology? Like, where, where, when did it show up on the scene? Well, vectors have been around forever. I mean, that's as part right, of I, the neural neural network model. Right. At the end of the day, they, those are vectors as as okay. well. And so this is just a now a data data specific because it's not just databases. Uh, while databases will be prevalent, uh, you will see search systems also expose their search index as uh, vectors, like Azure Cognitive Search, for example, does that, and I'm sure other uh, search systems do that as well. So you can take uh, that index and make it part, for example, of an open AI system or a BART or whatever system you like. Okay, that makes sense. So let's so let's actually get into the sort of stuff we were talking about, which is it sounds like vector databases is one sort of implementation model or way to think about implementation implement, implementation models that help us in this general realm. We were taught you use terms like like embedding just a moment ago. Um, and I know that's another one of these sort of implementation details. And I think it would be good since this is probably going to be a, a, a this particular session is going to be about implementation and how does this stuff work that we just sort of like do a little survey. So we did the vector database side of the house. Let's talk about what embedding is. And then I think we're probably getting into the land of fine tuning pretty pretty soon after that. Well, I think, I think we probably want to characterize like what vector databases actually are used for in the real world. And NLP, where embeddings comes to light, is one of those, right? So okay. taking word embeddings, sentence embeddings, um, making them specifically integer-based so large language models can actually include them in the corpus of information that's used to train, that's one vector database uh, use case. Another one we talked about, I talked about at the top, which is nearest neighbor. If I have this particular item object input, what are the nearest things closest or the farthest things uh, away from it? Uh, image and video retrieval, taking unstructured data, but vectorizing it so that you can find it and surface it and do all of those comparison things that are important. Anomaly detections are another one, geospatial data is another one, and then machine learning. But NLP is probably where we want to talk about, spend the time to, to talk about it. Uh, expand, expand your acronym, please. Uh, natural language processing. I thought that was the right that was the right answer, but I just want to make sure everybody else has got it too. Cool. Okay. So okay. So let's just can somebody just give me the like the two sentence version of what embedding means? 
because yeah. we were using so, it in context and I can kind of get it from context, but I really would love to hear the definition straight up. So think think about these large language models. Uh, they get trained primarily on the internet. So if you're looking at BART or you're looking at OpenAI, they get a copy of the internet as mm -hmm. the corpus of knowledge and they conceptually speaking vectorize it and put it into their large language model. That's conceptually how it works. Uh, obviously there's a lot more machinery behind it, much more complication, right. but that's the, uh, roughly how it works. Now that's a great set of knowledge. And if you use ChatGPT or Bing Chat or something similar, um, you will effectively access that internet. Then of course, this is great, but most of these large language models are static. Uh, so, for example, the OpenAI models get com got compiled at a point in time in 2021. So if you ask the model without any helper um, about the Ukraine war, it won't know because it got compiled, conceptually speaking, with knowledge that didn't, ex uh, didn't include the Ukraine war of 2022. And so now what happens is you bring in models uh, from the internet, for example, uh, that effectively allow um, these large language models to understand, oh, there is something beyond what I already know um, and bring it in. And obviously that's something for the internet search and stuff like that. But if you're an enterprise, you obviously care about the global knowledge because that helps you, but you want your specific knowledge also to be part of this search so that if somebody is like Eric is looking for specific things in his new company, um, the company's knowledge is available for him as well. And that's what's called data grounding. Uh, you effectively ground the model with the data that you have and expand the knowledge. And embedding is one technique of doing that. Uh, and embedding simply says, take this vector of knowledge and fold it into your um, larger model. So that every time you run a query, mm -hmm. this embedding will be part of the query that the system um, evaluates before it responds to you. And is it is it when you're embedding, are you giving the larger corpus a way to sort of say, to, like, here's a way to, to find pointers into your stuff? Or is it is it a handoff? Is it it's not presumably incorporating it into the model per se, right? It just knows how to reference the information. Is that is that safe to say, like, in terms of conceptually thinking about it? The, yeah, the, the way I think about it is the vector database stores the conceptual, um, the integer-based uh, representation of a concept found right. within a corpus of information, a, a web page on the internet, let's say, if that's part of the training. And what it allows you to do is to link near concepts together. So that's how the, the large language model, if it's trained on these vectors and these embeddings, really understands concepts. Uh, so it's the vectorization of semantic concepts, and then the distance equation between them allows the model to kind of stitch these things together and respond accordingly. Okay, so I get that. So that helps me understand how that how they relate to each other. What then is fine tuning, right? Which is another thing, right in this right in this realm. Before we go to fine tuning, I think oh, yeah, it's okay. worthwhile thinking about how can you go and uh, bring data to a a large language model. Time out, host interruption here. Uli's about to take us in another important direction. So let's pick that up in part two of this episode. Join us.